Thank you uh, for the uh, letting us talk about this. So this is part of, it's one task. In principle, it's about one task of one work package of Open Earth Monitor project, but it actually combines different things from different parts of the project. And so this is an opportunity a bit to set it up, to, to show a bit what we're doing at the Max Planck Institute where this is happening. And uh, uh, also, yeah, it's a bit, of course, we started this a couple of months ago, so it's not, I'm not gonna show you results, but it's more of the planification of where we're going and um, yeah, where we're going. So, um, and it's also a collaboration of many people who have been thinking about this. So GPP, greenhouse gas, um, why do we care? Why do we need to monitor land carbon fluxes more in general? So, um, this is how uh, the, the carbon emissions of our world in the past, what, uh, 150 years. And you see how, um, so the emissions are on top and this is what is being taken up by the, by the ocean, by the land, by the ocean and, and by the, and what's left in the atmosphere, right? So you see that the sinks are, are increasing along with our emissions. But this is changing, and this is important for us to know what is happening in the global biogeochemical uh, situation of the Earth. Um, regarding land, which is a bit what we're, well, what I'm looking at in general, there is an important part here on land use change emissions uh, due to land cover change. And there is the land sink from the, from the vegetation, that is, and not only the vegetation, that is capturing the the carbon. Now, that sink is one of the most uh, uncertain part of the carbon budget. So if you have the people who are doing these budgets, the, the one of the things that is making all these lines so uncertain, that's, um, th that's because the land sink is uh, the most uncertain. And somehow this slide was change when I put it because you had the error bars and you could see that the error bars around this is much higher. Strange. Um, now, there is the Global Carbon Project, which is a, it's a, it's not a, I don't know if it's, a, it's actually an organization that, uh, oh yeah, it's an organization, but it does, it's not like well, one physical entity. It's a, an effort to bring everything together to try and monitor and annually report how much carbon is being taken up by different parts of the, in different parts of the carbon cycle. And so they do this effort not to quantify based on models, based on um, observations and things like that. It's a, a big effort to do that. And part of the Global Carbon Project is also concentrate, uh, call, um, focused on regional um, aspects. And this is RECAP. And RECAP has been also partly financed um, through RECAP2, which is a, an ESA initiatives and things like that. These are our use case. So this is um, our stakeholders for our use case for this um, open, EO, um, open, EO, open Earth Monitor task. And what they need are a proxy for the CO2 fluxes that are come from land. Specifically, they actually need regular gross primary productivity maps, GPP is gross primary productivity. So how much carbon is being captured by the land, um, the flux of it that is captured by the land. And that's where this strange acronym comes in. SIF, uh, for those who don't know about this, this is called sun-induced chlorophyll fluorescence. And it's something, it's a quite a specific thing in, uh, for those who don't know about plant physiology, you might not have heard about this, but in remote sensing, this has become a bit more popular in the last eight years. And this is basically the, the thing behind is that plants actually glow, if you want to put it uh, in a ver uh, vernacular way, they, and actually the, they glow more when they're healthy. And this glow is a bit of an information of how good they're uh, photosynthesizing. Um, in practice, since we have some time, I could spend a bit more effort on this. But uh, basically, what happens in a plant to get to get uh, GPP and uh, photosynthesis? So GPP is down here. We start from PAR, which is the photosynthetic active radiation coming into the surface. And then there's plenty of steps happening there, in which different parts of the plant uh, are doing stuff. 
Uh, it's getting into photosystems and photorespiration. There's many things going on over there that determine how much you end up of the energy that comes from the sun to what is getting into the system, right? Fluorescence is a small component that's coming out here, a very small part, but that has a, a role. And what, what, what's happening is that the plants are actually re-emitting some of the light that they're capturing. For physiological reasons, they need to re-emit this. And that re-emission is proportional in a complicated way with how much they're photosynthesizing. And this emission is specifically at some specific waves, and I'm not gonna go into the detail of that, but this is a very small signal, but we can capture it from space, apparently. We've, um, we, we, like 10, more than 10 years ago, Christian Frankenberg and colleagues managed to get this out, this paper out that actually showed from opportunistic measurements from satellites that measure the atmospheric concentration of the atmosphere, so not made for this, they managed to capture the cycles of uh, what we understood as how much GPP is happening, uh, is being absorbed by the land. And um, they compared that to the best things that we had at that time from observations, which were actually things done by my colleague, Martin Jung and, and others at the Max Planck Institute. Um, so basically they saw high linear correlations between the satellite that was measuring this thing, this novel signal from space, very small signal, but captured apparently uh, well, and uh, our best estimations of GPP. So this was quite promising. No? And it was uh, opening a, a bit of a wave uh, of people that started using these SIF products in all directions as a proxy for GPP. So great, we see GPP from space. However, it's not so simple. And this is why I called it, and now we're a bit in the post uh, period where we, there we talk a bit less about SIF because actually it's complicated. And there's this, what I would call a non-fulfilled promise of SIF that uh, the reason behind that partly is because the relationship between photosynthesis and fluorescence is non-linear actually. So we have a part here, which is what when we see it. So this is, less photochemistry and more photochemistry, that is photosynthesis, and here is more fluorescence or less fluorescence. So this part that we saw was this linear part. But as you see, this thing is a nonlinear curve. And this part in the end is the periods, the moments when we have heat stress, strong heat stress, which are coming in the future. So basically, this is perhaps when we want to use this thing. And you see that the whole thing is actually nonlinear. And other work from also in uh, our institute uh, from David Martini had shown uh, that on ground stations in Mah Las Majadas, a place where we have a Fox Towers in Spain, with, uh, where they saw, they managed to measure these things on the ground. And indeed, you have a heat wave reaction that is different from the normal reaction. So they even see this on the ground. Bearing in, so this is pushing the thing. Okay, so this SIF signal is not so easy to use, no? And there's something more that needs to be done. Now, there's another problem with this SIF is that uh, it's spatially very coarse, much coarser for comfort for this audience in general, where we're talking often about 10 meters, 30 meters, things like that. This is at best uh, five to 10 kilometers because this is based on tropomy, the um, the instrument behind some of the plots of air quality that we saw in the last presentation. And so the product now from Luis Guanter uh, that was also made by us as a project uh, provides this, but it's a bit too coarse. And last also another point is that there's no long-term archive. And this is because the instruments that could be used to do this, um, first, they've never been designed for this. They've been designed for atmospheric um, um, measurements and um, and they, they they don't go far in time and they're very coarse. These we're talking about like like hundreds of kilometers sometimes, or tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers. And so this is not practical. So this is all to come to a bit this task that we have in Open Air Monitor, which is a bit to help in this direction to da develop a da special downscaling framework that could squeeze out a bit more the valuable information that we have in this in, in this uh, in this instrument uh, in this signal, uh, and try at least 
to make it available for our use case, which is uh, people who need to do carbon uh, monitoring and accounting. Um, now, this is a, a blueprint. We don't, again, as I told you, we're still designing things and we're setting things up, so don't expect results. But it's based on an old downscaling methodology that I developed, co-developed with Alessandro Cescati at the Joint Research Center some years back. Basically, we look at the moving window uh, of the original SIF product and see, so you see how coarse this can be. And we establish a relationship between other variables that we can have a fine resolution. And this relationship has some meaning based on the GPP relationship that I told you before. So we actually put some process-based understanding in them. And this relationship is optimized over that moving window to get us parameters, which then can be used in the reverse way, basically using things like in the original case was NDVI, a proxy of evapotranspiration and land surface temperature to give you um, downscaled safe. And it would end up being like that, that we could make a time series of downscale SIF um, that safe, which is perhaps not safe, but it is already a framework to downscale the information to a final resolution. Now, um, we are here targeting several improvements. One is that we want to do this with, uh, at some point with our friend in Brockman to use Xcube that from the work package tree to, to be able to implement this. Um, we want to have it as a modular tool that actually allows users to choose the model that they want to use to downscale. So I put an equation, but it could be another one. And it could be something including knowledge-guided AI. I come a bit to that after, but basically this model could be um, hybrid. And so, uh, but it could also be just an equation like we used before. And the user could choose different variables that are available on the platform. Um, the use case again is to apply it on SIF, but this could be something more generic for downscaling data um, with some process-based understanding, not just statistical downscaling, but something in which we actually put some information of the processing uh, of the processes that could go in there. Uh, in there. Um, now, we ideally this should be downscaled lazily on request on a platform, perhaps something that we don't need to downscale the whole thing, but just what is requested by users. This is perhaps on the more, I mean, to, to be seen how this can be implemented, perhaps in the Copernicus data space ecosystem, ideally. But then some questions arise also, partly how, I mean, this troposive data is not there yet in the ecosystem data set, uh, the platform. But so one of my questions for the colleagues uh, over there is, and Eza also is like, okay, how do we proceed to put extra things in the data ecosystem that are not there yet, even though there might become products, but can we already have them? Also, another question is who would pay for Creo Diaz in this case, or is it something that Synergize can finance us to do because they're in the consortium while we are here or something like that? Because in principle, if we do that, we, don't, we didn't have the budget to do that specifically. So the computing power, where does it come from? This is a bit more the logistical questions to the colleagues in the consortium that maybe it would be nice to discuss at some point. And the other thing is that we want to use a super moving window approach. So the moving window, um, do it in a better way. And, and what are we planning here? So this, um, luckily we talked about this in the morning. So the DGGS that Peter Stobel presented this morning and we had some discussion about that before. Um, so this is part of OMC, OEMC task 3.5 in which we have also uh, decided to move into this direction. Basically that task was supposed to help knowledge guided AI and hybrid modeling interface for EO data cubes. And this is basically the, the uh, step stone that we need to take. So the DGGS, as we said this morning, is a discrete global grid system. Basically we want to represent this, the earth, not as a cube anymore, a literal cube, but rather something that is spherical. There's many, and, there, and this begs some questions of how we do it, which model, et cetera. But um, basically there, uh, our colleague Daniel Loss is uh, currently working for Open Earth Monitor um, on this to develop a Julia package called DGGS.gl that would serve as, so basically the idea is not, we don't wanna impose, I mean, we, not at this point we're developing stuff. We, we won't impose 
ESA, uh, PCMWF, or uh, whoever in the Copernicus ecosystems to say, now you need to put the format in this system. It, that won't happen anytime soon. It could happen further, but we want to demonstrate. So this package, what it's going to be doing is to make the link and the indices between what you have in the data as it is to map it to this kind of surfaces so that actually we can apply operations on the surfaces, not lazily, that we can apply it on uh, as we go. And um, why do we want to do that is because we want to have a moving window and we don't want to have a moving window that is square, which has diff uh, different um, distances from the pixels. I mean, that's not optimal from a point of view of trying to sample things. We, want, we would want to have something that is equidistant. And so naturally, hexagons come to mind. Um, and uh, also here, there are like all, so they're all around with the same distance and they all have the same area. And also they are more adaptive to tessellate uh, the whole sphere. Um, because the thing is that we want to apply it on the sphere and we want to have a, basically it's a, to apply a window across everywhere so that once we go to the pole, for instance, the poles would not be overwhelmingly uh, represented by a projection that is a, a lat long projection or something like that. This will enable us to deploy more sophisticated deep learning techniques like convolutional neural networks that actually are applied efficiently across the surface. Um, at some point, maybe even going to graphical convolutional networks, which actually assume a graph instead of a, a, a specific grid. It's actually, in this case, perhaps the same thing. That leads me to hybrid modeling, which is what at Max Planck we call the combination of data-driven approaches and process-based understanding. I did mention it before. This stems a bit from a seminal paper from uh, our director and leader, Markus Eichstein, here also present. Um, about uh, the, the philosophy behind this. Basically, in the sense is, again, it's not, it's to go beyond just having machine learning uh, and deep learning by itself, but actually not throw away all the knowledge we have about the system, the physical system, the earth systems that we have, but then we impose some constraints in there to make it work in a better way. So we, we constrain, it's like making the data speak uh, letting the data speak, but in the language of process-based understanding. That's how I would see it. And in this case, I don't know if I'm going to go, I bother you with the, too much of the details of this physiology things from the plants about safe, but in a nutshell, we need to separate something that is more physiological, that is, how is the plant, the metabolism of the plant, if you want, of how the plant is actually responding to stress from structure, how the structural organization of the plant. The safe signal has both. So the, the observation, it has both, and we need to disentangle them. And this is the complicated part of what I showed you in the beginning with the, the sigmoid cord. So if the idea is that if we have observation on one side of SIF and we cannot have a proxy from structure that tells us only structure, we have some equations and we know this should behave in this way, and we can extract some parameters that, that are relationship between each other. In this case, uh, fluorescence yield, we don't need to understand too much about it, but basically this would be a constant when there is no stress, but then when there is stress, this would change. And the way to change it, this would be a neural network that can adapt and be under more physical constraint to do this uh, resolution. That's the more complicated part. If you want, we can talk more about it, but I don't think it's the point of this uh, uh, here to, to discuss more on the details. Also, by the way, this is partly uh, something that we're doing based on other projects that are working on this. On, on this. this is not exactly what we said we would do in Open Air Monitor. What we're doing in Open Air Monitor is more the downscaling framework um, that at some point this kind of re research um, uh, developments would be introduced, but maybe not within, at least not in the beginning of the project. And who knows if this goes in the end or in another iteration. There is one extra point to point out is validation. And uh, so we're gonna be downscaling this if uh, we're gonna have, uh, the question is also about to validate and to validate and compare to observations on the ground. The only place we get reliable GPP in general is from Flux Towers. And this leads to work package four. And so we're also involved in work package four where what we, so Flux Towers are towers like that, that measure through the technique of eddy covariance, how much, carbon is going in the system and out of the system. Um, and basically from there we derive GPP. 
And basically in the task, we have an open Earth monitor on this and uh, work package four, task nine, 4.9, I think. The idea is to have a tool that allows us to harmonize things between point and grid. Point being the foot here, the tower, and the grid would be the course resolution pixels. And for that, we, we uh, the plan and what we're doing also already is using Sentinel-2, and we would have like data cubes of Sentinel-2 like that to see a time series where we have a tower, for instance. And then we look at the value of uh, some variable of Sentinel-2, like uh, near V or some vegetation index or something at the tower over a given area and compare it to what the footprint of the pixel of the remote sensing sensor would do. And here, the idea is to capture the heterogeneity and quantify it. One index, that we, this is a simple index that we set up at some point, but that we could improve, uh, that we are currently improved with Daniel Pavon uh, right now to quantify, okay, how representative is my footprint of the tower in the center with the whole area that will be sampled by the remote sensing pixel. Um, yeah. And you get time series like that because this is dynamic. Um, this is a very homogeneous site in which it's mostly forest. You know? um, and so it's mostly the, the, an indicator could stay high all the time, but then you have areas where you would have um, heterogeneity that is variable in time, that sometimes the pixel and the, the footprint and the, of the tower and the footprint of the pixel are not matching and they're changing as we go along. Um, other places even that maybe they match, but there's a lot of variance. Again, I'm not going, we don't need to go into details more. Um, I mean, we've been, we're, we're currently a bit exploring these things with different sizes and different uh, indices. For instance, on this one side, you have an index that is quite high, indicating very homogeneous when you go at 100 meters, but then you go at coarser and coarser time series, and they become uh, arguably more mismatch. This could be, a, this is the idea is that, so for the tool in Open Air Monitor, the idea would be that we deploy this as a user, that the user can just go and pick up, uh, say a point and give a footprint of a tower, a footprint of a pixel, and then he, it would get the information straight away. Not that they would have to download Sentinel-2 data, but that this is done on the, again, on the Copernicus ecosystem or, or whatever as a service. No? Now, just to summarize, hopefully, um, just to put everything together in one last slide, this is what it looks like. No? So what we're trying to do is this SIF-based high spatial resolution estimations for the Global Carbon Project and recap uh, as a stakeholder. Um, the inputs, I mean, the, the, uh, the, um, this includes things from work package tree regarding um, the engine and how to, to put things together. We would couple it either to the Copernicus data space. I mean, probably this would be the place where this would, would be attached to, to get the data, ideally. Um, there's this task 4.9 from the work package four that will help and feed uh, to, to check that we're doing things right. And also there is, um, yeah, this is the other projects that are doing a bit more of the, the scientific part that might come in into the, into the use case in the end. So with that, I think that, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too long or too, uh, yeah, I don't know, confusing. Uh, I'm open for questions if we have, yeah. Any question? Yeah. So, uh, should I repeat? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, uh, if I can elaborate yes. on the hybrid approach and the neural networks and the, uh, yes, uh, if we want to, um, let's see. Um, so it's still under construction. Huh? We, we are not actually doing it, but the idea. So this are the observations. I mean, basically we have some equations that allow us to formulate a relationship between the observations of SIF and some other uh, um, variables that we can get uh, or we need to estimate. In this case, there's this fra escape fraction of how much of the fluorescence is 
actually escaping the canopy. This is something that is related to the structure of the canopy and that we need to have another indicator to, to link to. And this is this near VP that actually helps us to do that. Um, basically, combining different, uh, I mean, instead of taking the raw observations, combining it with other things in a way that we know that it satisfies some equations, we manage to, instead of looking at the observations that are instantaneous and that change with respect to, for example, lighting conditions and things like that, we get something that is more the efficiency of the plant. That's the idea from the physical part. And then from the, um, and, and this will change according to other uh, situations of stress. The idea is that, um, so the, the, um, the machine learning part of it, let's say, would be that this, this movement from this la theoretical line when everything is fine to something that is bended because of stress, we don't have the physical um, understand. I mean, if you talk to physiologists, they might have, but we don't have it scalable to the space conditions where we were looking at with big pixels with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of signal to noise ratio that we don't know. And so that's where the machine learning comes out to try to learn um, how, how to do uh, a, a shortcut, if you want, to do the thing that we cannot really quantify as a model. Now you'll say, okay, but how do you do that? You're not explaining uh, all the way. We actually there, that's a thing that I didn't want to include too much here is that we would be using simulations of a radiative transfer model scope that is actually doing things in an ideal case. And, and we're learning, we're teaching the machine learning on this simulation so that it can do the inverse in a more realistic situation. You'll use the simulation within the learning model or you'll use it just to uh, create data? So we use the simulation to create data and on the created data, we would um, train the model, which then we need to transpose to the real world to, to do the inverse. So, if you want. So, 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 okay, so you want to solve basically an inverse problem. Sorry? You want to solve an inverse problem. It is an inverse, okay. it okay, is okay, a okay. radiative transfer inverse problem. So only that there might be more, so again, more on the details, but maybe we can talk on the side, yeah. um, but that we would constrain it with other equations yeah. that are knowledge, that we all have as knowledge of the process that mm -hmm. actually, when you have a photon, it cannot escape. I mean, it, it either escapes as fluorescence, it's either used for photosynthesis or for uh, heat dissipation, but it cannot just disappear for instance. And so these are things that the machine learning uh, framework will be constrained to not invent things that could not yeah, physically yeah. happen. Okay, I'll, I'll come to you <laughs> in a while. Hey, Kai. Hey. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I came a bit late, so maybe I missed it. Uh, for your work on this like point grid harmonization, so usually it's like index that you can like calculate to see like how far your remittancing product is from the, yeah. the point. Uh, I think my question, like clarification is like how you plan to use it for, I mean, yeah, basically like, is it like for, for instance, in the context of Flexcom, do you want to like diagnose why we do like bad prediction for like specific sites? Or do you want to use it as a covariate for measuring techniques? I mean, maybe like to constrain the model itself or I didn't get why. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a key indicator, it's just like how you want to use it, basically. Yeah, so thanks for the question. The, the, for, so for us at Max Planck, we have different reasons to do this also, because, as you say, Fluxcom is something else we do in which we want to understand better how, when we apply machine learning techniques, what are the biases, what, I mean, and correct them when we're looking at heterogeneous areas that are a, a mismatch between the heterogeneity of the area and the foot, what the tower is seeing. So to basically, basically to, it's like a quality control of which flux towers are better or not for training, if you want. That could be one, one thing. In this case, it would be also a way to select which towers are more appropriate to say whether our sift downscaling is working or not. Because if it's one in which anyway, we're not talking about a representative area, you know, um, that we're downscaling to something that is not uh, fine enough. It still is heterogeneous. If we're going from heterogeneous to heterogeneous, maybe the downscaling will not help all that much. You know? uh, and so it's more to, to assess the quality of the, um, of the ground measurements, in our case, the, the flux tower measurements, which ones are more uh, appropriate or suitable for validating our product.
Uh, yes, partly related to that, uh, I think. Uh, on, on this, I, I was wondering, um, basically, if you, so how many uh, station you, you, you on how many stations did you test this? And uh, if you have some, some kind of um, statistics on that sense, so it's if there are, if a lot of towers are uh, not matching or uh, would have a high variability respect to the, to the, to what you've shown. And also, uh, uh, if you already, uh, so, so you, you just mentioned that the, the footprint is a, uh, is an important parameter because it can be more or less homogeneous. So if you already made these, uh, if you already put in relationship the, the agreement, the, the level of agreement between the two data and the heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity of the flag of the footprint, and as a last comment, <laughs> uh, because you just mentioned that you could um, assess the quality for this purpose, of course, of flux, uh, of the flux towers. But if it, if it is based on the footprint and if it is based on the homogeneity of the footprint, this can also change uh, with time. I mean, the footprint is something that is uh, extremely dynamic and every half hour you have a different, potentially different footprint, so a potentially different source yeah, area yeah. for your signal. So in this case, uh, and this is dependent mainly, not only, but mainly on the wind direction. So potentially the same sure. tower could be optimum in one sure. moment and not in another. So, so thanks, Simone. Let's see from the uh, end. Uh, so, so I agree with the, um, let's go for the last one. Yes, I fully agree. Of course, the footprint is changing. The idea here is, I mean, so for our open air monitor here, the idea is to set up a, a wor workflow that would allow a user to say, okay, I give you a footprint of satellite and a footprint of flux. And it could be a flux footprint at the, this half hour uh, with this wind direction because I calculated it, but it could also be an average or something like that because I don't have the the knowledge or data to actually fully give the dynamic thing. But the idea from the open air monitor, it would be like, okay, you give these two things and give get out some metric. So that's from open air monitor. Um, with Dario, we're also thinking and we, I mean, further down the chain that yes, we uh, are planning to have a system in which we actually have estimations for ICO hours in which it would be variable and that we actually want to do the match uh, better in, in uh, but this is like work that is beyond what we're doing here for now because it involves more dependencies and, and which come a bit from CMCC and, and you guys, I think, probably at some point. Um, on your question of whether I have statistics on which towers are better or not and etc., we haven't finished. This is also part of a legacy of another project sent for GPP in which we've been doing this to again validate towers and uh, validate GPP products and things like that. Um, we're, it's still work in progress, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I don't know if there was another one. No, the, that was two questions. You had another one in the middle. I don't know if I answered. It was related to the to, to this one, how many okay. stash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's work in progress. For Open Air Monitor, we're going to be doing this tool that should then allow to, to a user to, to do what they need without downscaling, downloading Sentinel-2 data. And by the way, the idea is also that it could be a bit transferable to other applications. So with Peter Seltner here in Eurac, they're doing it. They're going to be doing it for snow uh, validation. And so, yeah. Okay. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very enlightening. Uh, I was uh, having some um, thoughts about the the calibration with the ad covariance uh, towers, because um, on one end we have the the SIF that uh, I guess is um, is applicable to all uh, plants. So whatever the, the place they are. So even if, uh, if it's a mountain, if it's a planar surface things like that. But uh, while the eddy covariance is applicable only, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, only to planar surfaces with no, with no trees, you can do it, you cannot place it like with valleys and things like that, it doesn't work anymore. So yeah, I was wondering if you were taking into account this fact that there is not uh, much coverage that the, the eddy covariance can, can give to, maybe for, for this calibration, we're just wondering yeah, about yeah. that. 
So, so yeah, of course, you know, I mean, ethical variants have their limitations of where they can be. I mean, first also it's having a tower. I mean, ideally if we could, we would have many more towers than what we have and representing all ecosystems across the world, which is not the case, but that's because it's difficult to install them, maintain them, qualify, uh, qual I mean, that uh, Simone and others know better, uh, like it's a, it's a great challenge to put everything together. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so, but the thing is that it's not, it wouldn't be calibration really. Huh? This is more validation by itself. The, the, I mean, so we don't necessarily need them to, to downscale. So in a print, in principle is okay. Yeah, we would not be able to see if our downscaling products would be good in a slope, um, but we know it, yes. Um, how to do, but it's uh, difficult. There's not really an easy option, I think, in this sense. But um, that's why the, the choice of the towers is more to get the right towers that are appropriate to measurement. And this kind of thing of heterogeneity is one. But indeed, we could include also a digital elevation model in the footprint also to see that if we're in an area which is a valley of homogeneous of, tower, of forest, and but in the bottom of a valley or a top, this, this would be a red flag to not use it. But that we know from the PIs of the Flux Towers too, I think. Okay, I, I also have a question. Um, sure. So this uh, hybrid uh, process-based and machine learning yeah. framework, you could make it very simple um, so I want to ask you why not do that, uh, like very simple, because I'm more like a data scientist. So what I would just do, I would just run that process model and have independent points. Yes, so I get the target variable and I have independent points, and then I combine it with other covariates, and then I fit a machine learning model. Yeah. So that that to be built easy. Easiest That's thing. the easy thing, yes. uh, easy. I mean, it's yeah. not always so easy, but yes. The point here is that because of the, I mean, some people, so th this is why I, I wanted to uh, start with all these things about the SIF being a bit a non-fulfilled promise and that it's more tricky. It's a signal that people have used maybe easily also thinking, okay, let's make it simple and just throw that like that. But we know from the science that this signal is a tricky one and that if we don't pinpoint, basically the machine learning needs to be trained a bit more focused on the on the part that we know is a problem and it's this okay, thing yeah. that is this non-linearities and things like that and the idea the philosophy is like okay we do know from the science that there are some physical equations that should hold so the challenge of i mean this this extra layer to pass from the easy machine learning to the more hybrid would be to okay let's make the machine learning that actually is constrained by these things that we know should work like that and um, yeah, so it's not so different from what you see. I mean, it's, it can be simple too, to a point, but the devil is in the details, no? Okay, but you see the see. evolution, yeah. Let's, let's, let's see do what it together, let's do it together, let's see what comes out. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Gregory, do you have time for one more question? Yes, I have all the time you want, <laughs> especially. No, I rather clarification than, than a question. I think what you're talking is really, I think is really different. So, so one thing is having a complex uh, physical model where we know everything and then we emulate it and we create data points and, yeah. uh, and, and we emulate it with machine learning. That, that, that's also a way of interacting with process models and machine learning. But the idea of the hybrid modeling is really different. So it's basically it's a kind of an end-to-end -end approach where a neural network is embedded in the processing of, of, uh, of differential equations or, or, or some other mathematical formulations where we have the skeleton, but then certain coefficients like this phi, phi f uh, yeah. is, not, is not known how, how it varies. So these coefficients yeah. are then described not anymore with, from first principles from, uh, from physics, but this, there's basically a neural network that, that describes the phi f variability and yeah. it's embedded in the equation so it's really end to end i think it's a very different concept than yeah. doing the first one and then doing the other but it's together and i think that's a pretty strong concept because one is basically able to estimate these latent variables that are that are not observed and uh, have a have a machine learning model behind it that's hopefully then also interpretable thank you marcus 